morning everyone everyone well you're looking excellent this morning on a beautiful july summer day will it last who knows who knows hey why don't we just welcome back jamal and abby who've returned from honeymoon so good to see you i can honestly say church that jamal and abby's evening reception was probably one of the best evening wedding receptions i've ever been to i i thought it was brilliant that DJ was giving out some banging tunes. I almost danced at one point. It was pulling me out, but my inner, my inner introvert took over. But no, it was so good to uh, see you here, and, uh, and brilliant. And uh, oh, equally, Pastor Kirk and Tracy are having some annual leave on the lovely island of Cyprus. And uh, he messaged me this week you know when people are on holiday and they message you and they take a picture of the pool, but in front of the pool are their feet. Has anyone ever messaged you that, that, that? Can I just tell you something about your pastor? He has got the widest gap between his big toe and his first toe. I just thought I'd let you know on something private about our very own Pastor Kerr. That was the first, I looked at it and the pool didn't grab my attention. I just messaged him back, I said, my word, the gap between your toes, it is huge. But anyway, all that to say, they are having a wonderful time and just having some downtime. They work incredibly hard, you know that. And uh, often as I sit here listening to Pastor Kirk, and I have been privileged enough to go to different parts of the world, Australia and America and other parts, and I've sat in some of the biggest churches that this world knows. I've been to Hillsong Church in Sydney. I've been to their conference. I've been to Los Angeles at the Dream Center. I've sat in the Tommy Barnett's church in Phoenix, Arizona, and some of these huge stages of these massive mega churches. Can I tell you that our very own Pastor Kirk would easily go onto any of those platforms and be able to speak such an incredible message. We are privileged and blessed to have incredible leaders to pastor and drive us forward as a church. And I, I never want you to forget that we are blessed. Yes, they've sacrificed a lot, but we are incredibly blessed. And for the season that we have them, and let's pray, it's a long season. I want you to know that uh, the pastors we have are incredibly gifted and are here to help us as a church really move forward. So, um, so there they are, they're just having some downtime. But if you weren't here last week in, uh, in the message that Pastor Kurt preached, he preached the message called the ripple effect. Do you remember that one? And if you weren't here for whatever reason, I really encourage you to jump on our website and listen to that message because it was, you cannot have gone home not being motivated and inspired to be a ripple effector, to create some ripples in your world. You, couldn't, you would have been asleep if you didn't walk out those doors last week going, my word, I am called to change and create ripples in my world. And, and as Pastor Kurt talked about those stones that you know, we throw and they create ripples, to be someone who keeps throwing stones out about the good news of Jesus Christ. And I don't know whether about you, but I went home so inspired and motivated. But then the middle of the week caught up with me and I thought, how do I do that? How do I do that? And if it's okay with you, I would like to tag on the back of Pastor Kirk's message. And I want to encourage us and maybe equip us and help us all to be actually those people who are able to confidently and competently and well throw some stones out and create some ripples. So are you okay? Are you ready to join me this morning? Because yeah. I know this about being a, another person who has thrown a few stones over late, that ripples only occur when something's thrown. Ripples only occur. Ripples don't happen by themselves. It takes someone to throw something. Stones need to be thrown. They don't throw themselves, do they? Stones don't get up off the beach and l drop themselves in the water. They need to be thrown. You know, Jesus himself, he mentioned something about stones, didn't he? Remember, he was talking about, you know, that if the people didn't praise and worship God, then creation itself, the rocks, the very stones would cry out. But you know what? I think that God won't throw stones necessarily. You know what? God uses people like you and I to reach people. Yes, God can reveal himself to anyone at any point, anywhere. But more often than not, I have found, and more often than not, you have found, that Jesus will use you 
to reveal himself to others. Jesus uses people to reach people. He reveals himself once a stone has been thrown. And I want to encourage us all this morning. Let's, let's continue to be ripple effectors. Let's be stone throwers. But I want to help us this morning to equip us to be able to do that a little bit better. So if you've read any of the Gospels, and uh, if you've read the end of every Gospel, Matthew 28, Mark 16, John 20, all the ends where the resurrection has happened, you know what Jesus' very first words are after he has been resurrected? After he has risen from the dead, his very first words recorded in all the Gospels are words similar to, go and tell. Go and tell. Go out and tell others that I have risen, that I have resurrected, that I am alive. Go and tell. And it's been coined the Great Commission, hasn't it? Matthew 28, verses 20, something that every church has as their vision, as their mantra. Go and tell others about Jesus. Make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father. Tell people about Jesus and equally make disciples of Jesus. You know the word make in that original Hebrew language? It's a word that we can associate with kneading dough. Has any bakers in the room? When you knead the dough, it takes some effort, it's a process, it takes a bit of time, it takes some energy, and making disciples is that similar word. It's going to take some time. And Jesus told us, he tells his disciples that he says the harvest is plentiful. He says that there is, they're ready. People are ready to receive me and to, to learn about me and have faith in me. But then he goes on to say, but the laborers are few. I looked at that this week and I thought, you know why potentially the laborers are few? Why so many of us in churches all across this land are a little bit sheepish when it comes to talking Jesus? It's because maybe we don't believe the time is right. Or the fruit isn't ripe. Or the crop isn't ready. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful. But maybe it's because we've got things in our mind that we're just going, I don't think it's, they're ripe yet. I don't know whether you've ever been to a, a supermarket, you buy some bananas. Some of you like green bananas, don't you? And some of you like the yellow bananas. And some weirdos like the really spotty bananas. But you know, you look at a banana, don't you go, you're thinking, is this ripe? Is this ready to eat? And I think sometimes we have that inkling in our, in our hearts and our mind. Ah, oh, is my friend ready? Is my family member ready? Are they ripe enough for me to talk Jesus about them? And I may be, I'm not a good Jesus talker. There are many people in this room who are so much better at sharing the good news of Jesus than me. I, I know that. But maybe it's feelings that you have like I have at times that we don't feel they're ripe enough to talk to because actually our decision that they're not ripe derives out of a feeling of inadequacy from our point, a feeling of maybe shame, maybe feelings of fear and just cluelessness. I wouldn't have a clue what to do, what to say. And so I want to establish from the very beginning of our little talk this morning that we're all called to talk to Jesus. We're all called. And how do I know? Let's go through the who, the what, the when, and the why. And on the screen behind me, we'll give you some ideas. So who is called to talk Jesus? Well, guess what? Us. <laughs> We're all called to talk Jesus. The Great Commission. Go and tell everyone about Jesus. He wasn't speaking to the special few on the front row. He wasn't speaking to the people who have gone to Bible college for three years. No, Jesus was talking about every single one of us in this room today... It says, go and tell everyone about me. So that's the who. It's the command. The great commission has become the great omission. In that we've kind of thought, well, I'll come to church because I want to know God and I want to have time to worship God and maybe the person at the front with the mic might help me this week in something. And we come and we get things for us. But the greatest thing that Jesus wants us to do is not just be satisfied with our own spiritual maturity, but ultimately, the very first thing he said when he was resurrected, go and tell, go and share, go and speak about me, go and talk Jesus. Where are we to preach? Or when are we to preach even? I'll go with the list on the board. When? Now. <laughs> now, we don't have to wait till you feel qualified. None of us are qualified, let's be honest. 
You don't have to wait to feel qualified. You don't have to need to wait for a special moment. You don't need to wait. When are we to share all the time? 2 Timothy 4.2 is a scripture you can look up. That's when. Where? Well, Jesus said, go to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, to the ends of the world. Where are we supposed to talk Jesus? Everywhere. At your home around the dinner table this afternoon. Maybe at work tomorrow morning. Maybe in your sports and your sporting clubs and your gyms. That's where, that's where we're supposed to speak Jesus. And why? Why are we called? Why doesn't Jesus kind of reveal himself in the sky and the whole world looks up? That will happen one day, by the way. But why are we asked? Why does Jesus say go and tell? Why can't he tell people himself? You know, he does because why? Because God predominantly works and reaches people through people. That's how we are to share and why we are to share. And you can read that in Romans 10, 14 and 1 Corinthians 1, 21. So now that we all feel included that who is called, we are. When are we to share? All the time. Where? Everywhere. And why? Because God uses you to reach people. Now that we all feel included, just tell to the person next to you, go, are you ready for this? And they turn to the person on your other side or the, the person that you like the most and just say, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. So my goal this week is to help us with the how. With the how. So if you're taking some notes, it's the how. It's a very practical. I'm not going to preach at you this morning. I'm just going to share some ideas and thoughts that are from. We're going to look, look at two main scriptures this morning. And I really encourage you this morning. Be, be not just a ripple effector. Not just go, I am called to create ripples. But have the know-how. And then have the courage. Let's all have a go at doing this, the thing that Jesus asks us to do. Is that okay? So I'm not going to give you a 10-step success plan. Okay? It's just nine. I'm only joking. It's no, there's no success plan to this. There's no formula to this. But I've got a few simple suggestions that I think will make an incredible impact. And hopefully what you will find really really helpful. My first scripture that we're going to look at is found in John 4. And uh, for time, I'm not going to read throughout the whole story, but it's the story where Jesus meets a woman at the well. And it's a quite famous story. And uh, I'll give you the context of it. Jesus is traveling from town to town, and he's come to this place, and he sent his boys out, he sent his disciples to go and get some food. It's the heat of the day. It's midday, the Bible tells us. And he finds himself at a well. Now, in that town, no one goes to get the water at the midday. It's too hot. Everyone's kind of, it's siesta time. And everyone's chilling out, apart from this woman. This woman is a Samaritan woman. And Jews and Samaritan, a Jewish man, Jesus, and a Samaritan woman, in the culture of that day, in that period of time, do not mix. Do not interact. It's very much hands-off approach. And so here we've got Jesus looking for some water, and he asks the woman, he says, could I have a drink? And, uh, you know, she asks him, have you not got your own kind of cup, bucket? And uh, she gets him a drink. And then he says to the man, he goes, um, he said, I could give you a drink that would never cause you to thirst ever again. And she begins to, put, you've got to put yourself in the picture here. If, imagine if someone had said that to you, I can give you something to drink that would mean you would never be thirsty again. You'd either think bonkers <laughs> or you'd be quite intrigued. And Jesus goes on to ask her a few questions about who she is and, and what she's doing. And then Jesus says, oh, you know, have you got a husband? And she says, no. And Jesus says, well done, you answered correctly. She goes, what do you mean? She goes, because actually you've been with five other men as husbands and now you're with your sixth. And she's like, uh-oh. <laughs> and she's, the Bible tells us that she begins to think, she, she must think, this guy's a prophet. This guy's a prophet. How does he know this? And actually then she starts to think about, is this person the, the Messiah that us as the, the Jewish people are waiting for and wanting for and longing for. Is this, is this the Messiah? Is this the anointed one? Is this the saviour of the world? And, and Jesus begins to talk to her. And the Bible tells us that because he said so many things about her, that she runs into the village where she's an outcast because she's on a sixth fella. 
And no one wants to associate with that. And she goes and she starts talking Jesus. And the Bible tells us that the whole village comes running out to the well at midday. And then the disciples return with their food. Imagine returning with some Tesco bags, coming back in, and then you suddenly, you're greeted with what can only be described of probably a few hundred people around the well, and there's Jesus right in the middle. And I want to encourage you, church, that from this story, we can pick out four simple things of how to talk Jesus better. Number one, build a bridge, don't burn it. Build a bridge with people. Don't burn it. You know, Jesus calls us to not be separate from the world, but to permeate into the world. Don't separate ourselves in our little tiny, you know, in our little comfortable cliques where, oh, I've just got all my Christian friends around me and our life is good. No, I hope you've got non-Christian friends. I hope you mix with non-Christian people at work and outside of work. I hope you do. Because Jesus called us not to burn bridges, but to build them. And here he builds bridges. The second thing I get from that story is that sharing starts with caring. Sharing starts with caring. And you know what? Do you and I care enough about people who aren't going to spend an eternity with Jesus in heaven? Do you care about those people who you think probably aren't? If Jesus came back today... With some of your friends, with some of your family, do you think they probably won't spend the eternal life in heaven with Jesus? Sharing starts with caring. Caring stirs us into sharing. Caring stirs us into sharing. Fearing stirs us into veering away from people. Fear caused Jonah to veer away from the city of Nineveh. Caring stirs us into sharing. Fearing will cause us to veer away and not talk Jesus to people. And the fourth thing, I'll pick up on that story, just use tact. (laughs) Very simple message this morning. I hope you just take it in the simplicity that I'm delivering in. But use some tact. Saying the right thing at the right time and going in with humility and not pomp is the best thing that you could do to talk Jesus with the people that you care for. Jesus didn't go at the well and go, hey, do you know I am the anointed one, the savior of this world? Did you know that you are on your sixth fella and I could tell you about this, this, this and this? No, 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 no. He went in with humility. He said, can I have a drink? Use tact. Don't bombard people with Christian ease, Christian jargon, Christian language. You know, please, please, please don't be asking around the desk tomorrow, someone, are you washed in the blood of the lamb? (laughs) Please, please don't. I beg you. I beg you don't. Don't ask the person, don't ask your neighbor as you're putting the bins out, would you like to be part of Christ's body? Please don't. Don't, you know, talk to your brother or your sister, your your mom, your dad, and don't say things like, do you realize that Jesus can atone for your sin and sanctify you from the inside out? Now, all those words are theological words, and they're all true, and they mean something incredible, but to the most illiterate generation that has ever lived in Bible terms, please don't use them in everyday language. Yes, there's times to talk about what does sanctification mean and why, what does it mean that Jesus atoned for our sin and what does it mean that you are washed in the blood of the Lamb. Yes, there are times for that, but it's not when you're putting your bins out on a Thursday night. <laughs> and it's not when you're about to have a microwave meal at, at, at 30 minutes at lunch. Let's use some tact, church, and let's approach people in a way that's going to help them. And the last thing from this story, it is time. Everyone say, it is time. Let me read you the last three verses of this encounter with Jesus and the woman at the well. Remember, the whole village is out. Jesus is probably having a great time. He's teaching. And the disciples have kind of rocked up with their Tesco bags. And they're like, oh my word, I wasn't expecting this to happen. 
And the last three verses, it's on the screen behind me, hopefully. Jesus turns to his disciples and he says this to them. He says, why would you say the harvest is another four months away? Look at all the people coming. Now is harvest time. For their hearts are like vast fields of ripened grain, ready for a spiritual harvest. And everyone who reaps these souls for eternal life will receive a reward. There's your reward, church in heaven. And those who plant spiritual seeds and those who reap the harvest will celebrate together with joy. And this confirms the saying, one sows the seed, another reaps the harvest. And Jesus said, I have sent you out to a harvest field that you haven't planted. Where many others have labored long and hard before you. And now you are privileged to profit from their labors and reap the harvest. Church, it's time to harvest. And there are generations gone before us in this church that have labored long and hard. There's people who have prayed before you even knew they were existed for what you're about to encounter tomorrow. There's many people in our church who have prayed for years and have sown seeds for years. And now I believe it's a time to start harvesting church. It's a time for us to start harvesting. Because why? Because it's now. It's time. Tell the person next to you, it's time. You know what, church? We don't have to wait for Billy Graham Association to rock up into Birmingham next year. They're coming, by the way. But we aren't going to wait till July next year. We can start talking Jesus now. It's time. Jesus said over 2,000 years ago that the time is right. So what are we waiting for? Another 2,000 years? Come on, church. I, like you, are as scared as anyone in this room when it comes to talking Jesus at times. But the time is now. The harvest is ripe. We've all had those embarrassing moments, haven't we? We've all had them. Where we've said the wrong thing. We've used the Christian jargon. We've kind of got kerfuffled and a little bit, ooh, I don't know what I'm saying. We've all had those moments. We've had those moments when we're just thinking, they're clearly not interested. And they might not be. We've all been convinced that we shouldn't be talking about Jesus. I've been there. You've been there. Come on. We're all using that same excuse. Well, I'm not an evangelist. Well, I'm not an evangelist. That's not my gifting. I know that. But it doesn't mean I can use the excuse that I'm not called to evangelize and go and tell people about Jesus. No one can use that excuse. Don't use that excuse. Whether you're the most boldest extrovert around or you're the most shyest introvert around, We're all called to go and talk Jesus. And I want to use a second scripture just to give us three things that I think will help us in throwing those stones and creating those ripples. And it's found in Colossians 4, verses 2 to 6. And we'll read this together, if that's okay, Abby. Here we go. So, this is Paul right into the church in Colossae. And he's in prison as we write, as he writes. And we've heard a lot about Paul recently. And last week we finished him ending up in Rome. But he's now writing to the church in Colossae. It says this. He says, Be faithful to pray as intercessors who are fully alert and giving thanks to God. And please pray for me that God will open a door of opportunity for us to preach the revelation of the mystery of Christ for whose sake I am imprisoned. Pray that I would unfold and reveal fully this mystery, for that is my delightful assignment. Walk in the wisdom of God as you live before the unbelievers and make it your duty to make him known. Let every word you speak be drenched with grace and tempered with truth and clarity, for then you will be prepared to give a respectful answer to anyone who asks about your faith. I want you to notice the structure in Paul's letter. And I've pulled out and have emboldened a few things to help us see it. Have you noticed what comes first? Pray. He says it three times. He's helping the church out. Listen, when you want to talk about Jesus, there's a structure to it. There's an order that's going to help you. Pray. 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 Live. Speak. Pray. Pray. Pray, 
live it, speak it. And I want to, that's my message this morning. Let's pray it, let's live it, let's speak it. Let's pray it, let's live it, let's speak it. And I want to help us this morning to understand that I'm no, like I said, I'm not an evangelist. Maybe you are, I'm not. But I understand that we've all been called to go and tell everyone about Jesus. And you know what? I've told you this story before that I felt for many a time Jesus prompted me to start a work-placed prayer meeting. I've told you that. And I've told you for many, a long time, I went, I batted it away. God, you're having a laugh. Don't be so silly. You need to use a spiritual person like Joel, not me. And I batted that away for a long, long time. And it just kept coming back. Simon, I want you to start a workplace prayer meeting. I'm like, God. Okay, so I plucked up the courage. Go, I went and got permission. And as I've told you before, that started. And I'm so pleased to tell you that the lowest ever attendance I've had at the workplace prayer meeting is seven. And the best we've had is 14. And it's brilliant. And that's happened every Tuesday morning at quarter past eight. With people, I don't think, actually, some of them believe in God. They don't pray. I don't think some of them go to church. But for whatever reason, as I pray, God help me in this venture, please. That something has happened that I haven't been able to see up there. But we've created a space where people can come if they want. And they've just rocked up in their sevens and sometimes their fourteens. And I just share a quick thought from the Bible, something that could be relevant to their life, something they could be find helpful. And then we pray for a few short minutes about some needs in the school, maybe some of the staff who are struggling with personal challenges. And guess what? I pray and no one else does because they're not that brave yet. But it doesn't matter. We've created a space, but I want to encourage you, church, as you begin to think about who am I going to talk Jesus with, just first things, pray. Pray about it. Because prayer alters vision. Prayer helps me see things that I couldn't see. I could never have seen a prayer meeting at quarter past eight on a Tuesday led by me in a school. Are you having a laugh? I barely get up at eight o'clock. But prayer alters vision. Prayer helps you and I see those opportunities and I pray that we take them. It took me a good few months, church, I'll be honest, to take that opportunity. But I'm so glad I did eventually. I'm so glad the Holy Spirit kicked me up the backside a few times and said, come on, what are you playing at? There's people out there who are going to go to an eternal eternity without Jesus. And I pray that as we pray, we see those opportunities. Let's not be sleepy. I was sleepy for too long. Don't be sleepy, church. But let's be alert. Let's be watchful. And as we pray those opportunities will come. Prayer shows you, shows me where we can make the difference. And some of us live that out better than others. And there's some of you in this room that are much better than me. But let's pray intentionally for those doors of conversation to open. Church, will you promise me that you're going to pray for those doors to open up to you? I want you to promise yourself. And I want you to pray it this week. And it doesn't have to be a long prayer. It could be a short prayer. God, I pray this week, a door of opening will happen. A door of conversation will be open. And I'm telling you now, church, if you pray it, be prepared that that door's going to open. (laughs) Prayer opens doors. It opens doors for God to move. And Paul, who writes this letter, he doesn't pray that his prison door will open. If I was writing the letter, I'd be be writing, God, please open my prison door. He He doesn't pray for it. He prays that the doors of conversation will be open for all of us and our prayers I encourage you don't let your prayers be exclusively about what you need you know the Lord's prayer is a model of prayer where we say God give me this day my daily bread and we talk about the things that we need the things that we're desiring the things that we're facing the, the challenges that we're going through and our prayers can be a lot about what I need what I need but also church I want you to flavor your prayers with that last bit of the Lord's prayer God let your kingdom come Let your kingdom come. And so the first thing is to pray it. Everyone say pray it. Pray it. it. The second thing I get from this scripture is live it. Live it. Live it. Less of talking, more of walking. We can all talk the talk, can't we? 
at times. But it's harder to walk the walk. I'm going to show you later some research that was being done in the United Kingdom by a substantial and well-known research group. And they did this research and they asked some questions about people's responses to Christians and faith. Can I tell you that 67% of people in the United Kingdom say they know a practicing Christian. Two out of every three people say they know someone who practices Christianity. Now, it could be Catholicism. It could be the Church of England. It could be Methodists. It could be Anglicans. It could be Evangelicals. But two out of every three people, the research that came out was so mystifying that they said this cannot be right. So they did the whole thing again. And 67% of people say they know a practicing Christian in this country. Man, that's good, isn't it? That's something to celebrate. But it means that we're being watched. We're being watched. And if people can't see Jesus in your life and my life, then guess what? I'm hiding him too well. But we're being watched. We're not being watched with binoculars out the bedroom windows, hopefully. But we're being watched as we go about our life. And 2 Corinthians, another letter from Paul, he writes to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 5 verses 20. He says this, he says, we are Christ's representative. And at the bottom, we are speaking for Christ himself now. Man, that's a tall order, isn't it? We, you, me, this church, we're speaking on behalf of Jesus now. We're representing him. Another translation says that we are letters of recommendation. You're a letter of recommendation. I hope you're recommending the right things. We are the TripAdvisor review. And let me tell you something about TripAdvisor. That we booked a holiday this summer coming. And we found a nice villa, didn't we, Dan and Janine? And we found it and we looked really nice. And we went on TripAdvisor to check out that it was all kosher. Five out of five stars. The best holiday we've ever had. The host was amazing. He'll even, he even picked us up from the airport. We thought, this is fantastic. What a review. We booked it. We were conned. We were scammed. We've lost our money. Ah! I'll be taking up an offering on behalf of the Lakin family <laughs> at the end of church. But you know what? All that to say, don't worry, we're sorted, we're okay. But we are a trip advisor review. We're a review for Jesus. And when people look at us, I don't want my life to con people into the wrong thing. I want my life to be a great review. I want it to be the best review. I get it wrong at times, clearly. So do you. But I want my life for the majority of the time to be the best trip advisor to heaven ever. And we are letters of recommendation. And we bought into that because it sounded good. And people will buy into Christianity because of who you are. They'll read you before they read the Bible. For most people. And I want to encourage you. Let's live it. And let's live it well as we constantly leave reviews. Let's leave some good reviews. The Bible says let your light shine. So that others may see your good deeds and praise our Father in heaven. And light shining can look like a variety of things, can't it? One of the worst things that Christians are, I suppose in a bad way looked at, is that we don't respond to criticism well. Did you know that? That's come out. It's top one. What are Christians like? They don't respond to criticism well. (laughs) So let's respond to criticism well. When someone critiques your style, your management style at work, the way you handle a situation, let's handle that well. Because we are constantly leaving reviews. The way we relate and interact with people portrays an image of Jesus. It's like you've got a projector at the back of your head, projecting a picture of Jesus behind you as you walk. Let's, put, let's project and let's portray a great image of Jesus in the way that we live and act and talk and walk and communicate and interact with people as best as we can. And let's hold our hands up when we get it wrong. Let's not be that kind of high and mighty church that we're always getting it right, because we ain't. But let's be honest enough. And let's not hype or exaggerate faith. You don't need to hype your faith. You don't need to exaggerate your faith. You don't need to kind of big it up and spin it like our politicians might. 
We don't need to spin nothing. We just need to live out our faith. Because people are looking for realness. They're looking for in the depths and complexities of life, in the struggles and the challenges and the anxieties and the stresses that we all face at times, through the unruly teenager that might be in your house, to how you handle your parents, to how you handle this person at work, to how you handle your boss because you don't like him. We are constantly looked at. And just let the depth and reality of your faith be the thing that protrudes and kind of flows out more than you having to spin and hype and exaggerate your faith. People are just looking for reality. People are looking for... They're learning to do more than learn about a faith. People are looking to live out a faith. You can learn about a faith from the internet. You can learn about a faith from a textbook. You can go back to school and learn about a faith. People are not looking to learn necessarily about faith. They want to learn how to live out of faith. And why you're living out of faith is so crucial to your existence and my existence. You know, as I watch soaps and sitcoms from time to time, you know, the whole plot is resolved in 30 minutes, isn't it? It's like life is sorted within 29 minutes with a few adverts thrown in. But you know, life isn't like that, is it? Life can't be resolved in 25 minutes. And all's good and all's happy and we move on to the next thing. Life isn't like that. And just be open enough that as we genuinely interact with people, as we talk Jesus, that our faith will activate something in them that will make them more open, more hungrier and more willing to dialogue with you. So the last thing is speak it. The first thing was what? Pray it. The second thing was Live it. The third and last thing is, speak it. Oh, this is the one that we're all going, I don't want to. Speak it. You know, we, just, we can't live out the message of Jesus quietly. I'm sorry. We can't just live it out quietly. You know, well, I'll just pray and read my Bible at home and I'll come to Connect Church on a Sunday and I might go to a Connect group and... I'll do that all quietly and all reverently, and there's times for that, but you can't live out the greatest message that's ever been told quietly. You know, St. Francis of Assisi was assumed to have said, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. I've heard many preachers preach a whole thing off that. That is flawed. That message is flawed. You can't preach the gospel without using words. What is the gospel? It's the good news. The good news. You go home tonight, put the telly on mute, turn the subtitles off and watch ITV at 10. You tell me if you can figure out exactly what's going on in those stories just by the pictures you see. No. Words. Words help us. Words convey a message. Words tell a story. We have to speak it. We can't just live the explanation of what Jesus has done. People need to know, how has it happened? How is this news good for me? Why is that faith for you so incredibly important to you? People want to hear you and me speak it. Are we all feeling challenged? Because I know I am. Because I've got to now live this out. If I'm daring enough to come up here and tell you to do it, it means I've got to do it. And I'll be the first one to do it tomorrow. Guaranteed, Jesus is going to do something, isn't he? He's going to go, Simon, you told the church. So you go first. It's bound to happen. If the news of Jesus has been so good to you, has it been good to you? Yeah? Then why keep it to yourself? Why keep it to yourself? No one can hear it unless you tell them. They can't guess it. You know, if I was working with Richard at his school, I can't guess he's a Christian. If I was working with Francois at his place, I can't guess he's a Christian because he's lively. (laughs) Not all Christians are bouncy like Francois. (laughs) Just because he's bouncing around doesn't mean he's a Christian. (laughs) You could be the quietest person in your workplace and that is absolutely okay. That is fine. You need to be happy in who you are. Whether you're the biggest extrovert (laughs) or one of the introverts, we need to be happy with who we are, but we also need to be able to speak it. And I want to tell you something today. This week, I'm going to speak it.
come on, tell yourself, this week I'm going to speak. Because when you live it, it gives opportunity for you to speak it. So if you're going to live it, you might as well speak it. <laughs> if we're going to try and live like Jesus, become Christ-like, we might as well speak it. It's just going another little step. Yes, it's fearful. Yes, it's a bit scary. Yes, we might get it wrong. But if we're going to live it, we might as well go one extra step and start to speak it. Man, Paul even asks the church to pray for him as he goes out. The greatest orator of Christian theology ever. He says, church, please pray for me as I'm about to go and speak. People are praying for you all the time. Trust me, I have prayer meeting here at church. The connect group that prays is praying for you. And Lewis will make sure that happens. And whoever else is leading it will make sure that happens. We are constantly praying for every single one of us. And the, light, the last verse in that, Colossians verse 4 says, let your conversation be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may, have a, you may know how to answer everyone. Don't have a monologue, church. Have a dialogue. Have conversation with people. Let's just be real. As you are real at work, you don't pretend to be someone you're not. You don't walk in on a cloud which is real people having real conversations and let the Holy Spirit open those doors and when you know there's a door opening, take it. Seize the moment. Use tact, <laughs> please. <laughs> be thoughtful, be timely and season it with some salt. See, I, I like salt on my food. It's because I, I married an Italian. And we've got to have, haven't we, all, that, all the Mediterraneans, they've got to have a bit of flavor. And you know what? When Paul says, let your conversation be seasoned with salt, what does that mean? It means when you get the opportunity to talk Jesus, make it sound a little bit exciting. Don't be saying, well, I found Jesus and he has changed my life. My life is an absolute adventure. I've been to incredible places. Come on, church. Let's flavor it a little bit. If Jesus has done something good for you, give me a, give me a yeah. Come on, let's season our conversations a little bit. But you know what about seasoning? And I try to season my food at home because my mother-in-law will tell me off if I don't. But I do know this. Is that I'm not going to get the whole salt thing and go, well, let's flavor it. Whoosh. Because that would be horrible. That would be, that would be disgusting. And what we need to do is when we talk to Jesus, just season it a little bit and then back off. Let people digest maybe that comment, that question. And then when you get another time, just season it a little bit again. Just back off. Pray for them. You live it out. And when you get to speak it again, just a little bit of seasoning. Just a little bit of seasoning. Make it helpful. Share your story. Don't read about someone's story on the internet and pretend it was you. Most of us haven't been locked up in jail. Most of us probably have, weren't addicted to some kind of chemical. Most of us maybe haven't got this incredible transformation that we look for. Most, most of us just live simple, boring lives like me. But a simple, boring Simon serves an incredibly amazing God. And your story, your story as bland as you think it is, isn't. When you spice it up a little bit. You don't make things up, you're just real. Man, this is what's hap this has happened to me. My teenagers would do me head in. I didn't know what to do, but I found a scripture in the Bible that helped me. I didn't know how to relate to my parents, or I didn't know what was happening here, but this helped me. I was struggling with my finances, but this teaching about Jesus really helped me. I didn't really know what to do in this, but this helped me. And I want to encourage you to talk to Jesus more, because Pastor Kirk encouraged us and motivated us so well last week. And I just felt as I sat there, I'm going to help the church just help them how, how to make those ripples.
And I'll close with this video. This video was, it's about Death Valley in California. Death Valley, you've probably heard of, is the most driest, hottest place in North America. There are miles upon miles of nothingness. Miles upon miles of salt plains. Nothing grows, nothing lives. But every now and again, every now and again, when the waters come, something incredible happens. Just watch this church. Southern California is home to some of the most extreme landscapes in the world. And there's none more extreme than its Death Valley. It's not only the driest place in America, it's also the hottest in the world. In 1913, temperatures here reached 134 degrees Fahrenheit, which remains to this day the hottest recorded temperature on Earth. What makes Death Valley a truly daunting landscape for humans is this, a seemingly endless expanse of flat, cracked Earth that covers more than 200 square miles. church would you stand with me as we close our service church all we're going to do is just go and water just go and water pray it live it speak it and this morning I just feel as, a, as an end it's not an altar call or anything like that but I know there's people in your life that you may have been praying for for a while or there's someone in your family that you just know doesn't know Jesus yet and you would love for them to know Jesus. Maybe there's someone at work who you're really kind of really good friends with, and they've watched you for, for a long time now, and you're just waiting and hoping and praying that they would maybe come to church one day. I don't know what it is for you, but I know you've got one person at least. And for the next 30 seconds, I just want you to pray for that one person that you've got in your heart right now. I know there's someone that you've got in your heart that you would love them to meet and know Jesus Christ as their own personal saviour. And I want you to pray for them because that's what we do. We pray first. We pray first. Out of the prayer, those opportunities will come. And I want you to be bold enough to seize them and speak it. Come on, church, let's just pray. I'll give you a bit of time and space. I'm not going to give you long, but I want you to pray not just for them, that God would meet them, but that you would have an opportunity, that you would have a door that opens, that you would speak it. And that's what I want your prayer to be for them. God, we've prayed prayers today that have really come out of our heart. We've really wanted to see that person come to know you like we know you. And God, as you've heard our prayers, because you do listen to them, God. And God, we've not only prayed for them, that they would find a relationship with you, Jesus. But God, what we've really prayed for is for your Holy Spirit to empower us to give us the boldness and the courage just to speak it. And God, I pray that this week, 
this coming seven days, whenever it drops, whether it's first thing tomorrow morning, whether it's halfway through the week or whether it's next Saturday, I pray for every single one of us who have prayed that prayer this morning that God, an opportunity would open, a door would open. And God, I pray that you would give us the courage to step through that door. God, give us the boldness. God, we pray that fear would have no way. That God, feelings of inadequacy would be diminished. God, we pray that feelings of shame about who you are, God, would go. And that Jesus, we would, having prayed it, having lived it, God, we'd speak it. We would speak it. Help us to talk Jesus more. Help us to talk Jesus more. Help us to talk Jesus more, I pray. You know what, church? Just look at me for one minute. I just want to encourage you that if you want to talk Jesus more, I want to encourage you you to practice how you're going to say it. Because if you go in cold, God, I've prayed and the opportunity comes, I want you to be able to take that opportunity really well. And I want to encourage you to practice the good news of Jesus. I want you to write it down if you need to. What is the good news of Jesus? After church, I challenge maybe to get with your friends and go, okay, in one minute, tell me the gospel. Because that's what we did to Matt when we employed him. One of his interview questions was, tell us the good news of Jesus in one minute. He passed the test. I'm joking. But you know what? Can you, can you describe, can you explain the good news? And if you can't, then come and see someone at the front. Come and speak to me. Come and speak to Matt. Come and speak to Joel, any of our core team leaders, and say, can you help me in explaining the good news of Jesus Christ? And they will gladly help you because they're going to quickly go and look it up themselves now. <laughs> but I encourage you, be prepared. If you've prayed it, it's going to happen, so you've got to prepare yourself. And if you're not prepared, that's when you're going to go, I'm not doing it. So you're going to back away. Yeah? I hope you've had a great morning in church. It's been brilliant. The band have been fantastic. Joel led us so well. And I just pray you're blessed this week. And we're going to finish with this new song that Francois is going to jump around at. And I want to encourage you just to express yourself in your own way to God. But you cannot tell the good news of Jesus by doing this. It's just impossible. If Jesus means something to you, if Jesus has changed your life, be a little bit expressive this morning. If that means clapping your hands, go for it. If that means pumping your fists, go for it. If that means jumping around, do it. If that means sitting down and just swaying like this, do it. I don't know. Do what you need to do. But let's express our thanks and love to God this week. Amen.